1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Now, if you would, as you continue to turn there, um, or if you've already found your place, pray with me one more time as I ask for the Lord's help. <clears throat> Father God, we thank you for this morning, for this day that we get to celebrate the miraculous truth of your resurrection. Father, I pray that you'd give me help as I try to unpack your text, your word. God, I pray that your word would go forth and not man's opinion. Father, I pray for attuned hearts and minds this morning. Father, I pray that you would encourage us by the evidence that you've given. Lord, I pray that we as a church would be strengthened, emboldened by the truths that we see today. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> All right. So Friday, we had a Good Friday service. Uh, if you were here, we looked at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. If you weren't here, maybe you read it for yourself or, or took time to reflect on the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Um, but but let's, let's take just a minute to, to think back to Friday. So, so Jesus, who had lived 33 and a half years, the last three years of his life, did many miracles and great signs and wonders, claimed to be God to deliver his people from their greatest enemy, died. Just, just like any other man. Put, put yourself, if you could, in the disciples' shoes, in his followers' shoes. For three and a half years, they had followed him, listened to him, watched him, put their, their entire life into his hand. They were betting their life on what he was saying. They became enemies of Jerusalem and Rome. They were hiding and afraid because their master had died, just like any other man. I want to remind us of Christmas. Christ's conception was miraculous, but his birth was ordinary. He was born just like us, and he died just like we will. He was fully man. Yet to his followers, he claimed to be fully God. So put yourself again in the disciples' shoes. You're afraid. You're an enemy of the state, essentially. You're hiding in a room, not sure of what your future is going to hold, because your God has died. I would probably be thinking, was... was this wasn't true. I put my life in, into someone who died just like I'm going to. But, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Amen. King Jesus is alive. Church, our king is not dead. Amen? Amen. He's alive. And, and he's not sitting up in heaven twiddling his thumbs, just waiting to come back. He's reigning. I heard a pastor say this past week that sometimes he wakes up and just thinks, is, it, is, it, is anybody in charge? They look around at the world and think, what's going on? Does anybody have a clue? But we can be assured this morning that Christ is reigning on his throne and nothing happens that his omnipotent hand doesn't allow or cause to happen. Amen? King Jesus is alive. But look at what Paul says in verse 20. But in fact, Jesus has been risen. In fact. Jesus has been risen. How many of us this morning think that Christianity and that, the, and, and that the resurrection is something you just have to have faith in? It's blind faith. You just got to believe it. No, we don't, 
You don't need to know that it's a historical, like you just gotta know, you just gotta have faith, right? I worked at Winslow Dining Hall, which is the dining hall on Murray State's campus. And while I worked at Winslow Dining Hall when I was in college, I had a friend who was an atheist and we were managers together and our, our shifts overlapped. And we intentionally did that because we liked working together. Um, and, we, and we liked challenging one another. I really liked challenging him with the gospel and he really liked pushing back at me. But we did so in a civilized way. I mean, I was the best man in his wedding. So, you, you know, we were friends. Um, but, but when we finally boiled everything down, he said, but Eason, I, just, I have confidence in things like the Big Bang and evolution because I can see it. And I just don't think I can have that much blind faith in anything that, that Jesus rose from the dead and is alive today. I can't see that. Boy, I wish I could go back in time because I was not equipped to handle that the way that the Lord has equipped me now. And so my, my goal this morning in the next 30 minutes is to equip you with the little bit that I've been equipped with to be, to be able to defend the resurrection. But my, my bigger goal than that is that you would be, as I prayed, emboldened and encouraged that your faith, as Paul would write in 1 Corinthians, we're going to read in just a second, is not in vain. That your faith is, is legitimate, it's not crazy, and it's, and it's actually the most logical and rational explanation. That you who believe in the resurrection of Christ are actually the wise one. And that if you don't, it's arrogance and foolish. And I, I can show you based on the facts. Now, a lot of people will say, Easton, it is faith. You can't have confidence. We're a people of faith. There's a, there's a big movement right now in secularism that says, I'm, I have certain confidence in things like the Big Bang. Even though I can't see it, I have confidence because there's evidence. Well, let me just back up a second. For anyone who might be listening online or if you're here this morning and you're thinking, I don't need faith, I have confidence let, let me break that word down for you, okay? Confidence, con fide. It's a Latin word that means with faith, all right? So let's just, let's just say that you have faith. Every one of us has faith in something. And I'm going to try my best to show you with the word of God that our faith in Christ, again, isn't in vain, it's the most logical and the most rational that you can have. You, you who believe in Christ are not the fool. Amen? So let's, let's dig into our text. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Paul writes to the, to the church in Corinth. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, that would be Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the, but the grace of God that is with me, whether then it was I or they. So we preached, and so you believed. Now, if Christ is proclaimed 
as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because he testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If, Christ, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So wh why is Paul able to say, in fact? It is a fact. It, th this is not something to be argued this isn't subjection. This isn't an opinion. Paul is saying, in fact, just as 2 plus 2 equals 4, just as the sky is blue, Christ has been raised. Why is he able to say that? Well, let's back up and look. So, starting in verse 1, he wants to remind the Corinthian church of the gospel. Now, the gospel, again, the good news, euangelion, right? The good, that, that's a Greek word that just means good news. That's where we get the word gospel. So the good news, hey, Jesus died. Well, that's not very good news. Would you, remember? You're, you're one of the disciples. You're in the room. You're afraid. That's not very good news. But Christ raised from the dead. That's, that's great news. Amen? So, G, so Paul is saying, I want to remind you, brothers, of what I have already preached to you, that Christ is raised from the dead. A little, little context. In the Corinth church, there was, there was, well, not just the Corinth church, but just that culture in that time, there was this belief that there is no resurrection at all, that, that the body is something that's evil, that all material is something that is evil, and that the spiritual is what is good. So they didn't want resurrection of the body. They thought that was evil. They thought the body was, was evil. And so there was no resurrection of the body. But Paul is saying, hey, look, if there's no resurrection, then Christ hasn't been raised and you're still in your sins. There better be resurrection of the dead. Amen? Then he goes on, I preach to you which you received in which you stand and are being saved. So in the gospel, we hold fast. And if we hold fast in the resurrection of Christ, then we are being progressive. We are being saved. How many times have we said, are, are you saved? Past tense. Have you been saved? Past tense. Did you know that in the gospel, we must stand because we live in this paradox of already, not yet. We're already saved, but how many of you have still sinned this morning? I have. In the gospel, we are being saved from our sin. But what are we being saved to? A life without sin. But what's that look like? That looks like a glorified, resurrected body. Did you, did you know that this body right here, this body, your body, is going to be dust when you die? But then, when the Lord comes back, He will raise these bodies. Th these bodies. You're not getting a brand new one. You're getting a remade one. It's, th it's this body. little side note. This is why Christ says that sexual immorality is the worst of all sin. Because it's a sin against your own body. These bodies are eternal when they're glorified. They're going to die, but we're going to live with these forever one day in a glorified, perfect sense. Is are you tracking with me so far? So Paul is saying there, be there better be resurrection from the dead. There like our bodies better come back because if not, if you're saying there is no resurrection, then not even Christ has raised. If Christ hasn't raised, 
You're still in your sins, and you won't raise from the dead. Resurrection is, is vitally important. Now, that's just the five-minute theological lesson about resurrection. I don't want to step on Travis's toes. I'm sure he's going to get there. Brother Travis is going to get there, I'm sure, in the second service. But let's look at the evidence. Right now we move on. Paul said this, For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received. Th let's think about this. Paul, who was Saul, S-A-U-L, whose name was changed to Paul. Saul was persecuting the church in the first century. So much so, he was rounding them up and killing Christians. That was Saul. Saul, Saul, Saul was a Jew who, whose like sole mission in life was to kill, literally, the Christian movement. He, he saw it as an evil, a heresy, a blasphemy against God. He was a Jew of Jews. He said, I'm going to knock it out, right? Saul became Paul and is now preaching the resurrection of Christ. How, how does that happen? How, how are you so set against one thing, calling it evil, and, and then all of a sudden he, he preaches it as of first importance? The most important thing he preaches is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. How does that happen? It says, what I also received. You can read in Acts. In Acts, Paul was on the road to Damascus. And what happened? Jesus Christ appeared. And, it, and it's, not, it's not a spirit or just a light or a voice that Paul heard and saw. Paul did see and hear those things, but he saw Christ resurrected. And Christ said, Paul, or Saul, Saul, why, why do you persecute me? Paul was struck and blind and later given his sight back, and then he went into the wilderness. And in the wilderness, I think he was, again, give, given supernatural theological understanding of the Scriptures, and he saw, and I, I, I think, again, had fellowship with Christ. He saw Jesus. All right, so what does that make Paul? That makes Paul an eyewitness to the resurrection. I'm going to pick on Micah. If I, if, I were, if I were to punch Micah in the face and then he charges assault against me and then we go to court and, and you all saw it happen, right? And we're in court and the lawyers who are good lawyers say we need some witnesses. We're going to call just a handful of you all to the stand. And you all testify saying, yeah, I, I saw Easton for no reason. He just got off the pulpit and slugged Micah right across the face. I don't know. What, what, what's going to happen? Do I have a very good argument if all of you are saying the same thing against me and I have not one person? If I don't have one of you that says, no, Easton didn't really hit Micah in the face. If, if not one of you said that and every single one of you said, no, he hit him. What's the judge going to rule? That, that I'm guilty, right? That's overwhelming evidence of eyewitnesses to the crime. Follow me? Paul was an eyewitness. He saw Jesus. But that's not good enough, right? I mean, it is. But God in his grace gives us more. Look at this, verse 4 that he was buried, that he was raised, and on the third day in, a, in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. So let's unpack this for a second. I love what Vody Bauckham says. Okay, so this is not original to me. Vody Bauckham came up with this. If you don't know who Vody Bauckham is, you need to repent. And as soon as the service is over, Google him and save a sermon to listen to, okay? Vody Bauckham. He says this. He, I choose to believe the Bible because it's a reliable collection of historical documents. I'm going to say this pretty fast because of time. If you want to write this down but can't, come see me. I'll give it to you. It's a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. 
They report supernatural events in fulfillment of specific prophecies and claim their writings are divine rather than human in origin. So why, why can we trust that Christ is alive? Because you can, you can trust the Bible. And why can we trust the Bible? Because it's a reliable collection of historical documents. Let's think about that for a second. Did you know that the Bible was written by over 40 different authors in a span of 1,500 years on three different continents in three different languages, and it all tells the same story? And there's not one contradiction to be found. There are people that think that they can find contradictions, and they, and they seem to be contradictions until you read the rest of the Bible. And I promise you there's an explanation and not a pieced together explanation. It really does make sense. Okay? So, for example, let's look at the resurrection. In one gospel, there are multiple angels at the tomb. In another gospel, there is one angel at the tomb, supposedly. If you did a careful reading of those passages, you'll see that in one gospel writing, they say that there were multiple angels. In the other gospel writing, it just says an angel spoke. So someone could come in here and say, well, Easton spoke. Does that mean I'm the only one in the room? No, that just means that they left out everybody else in the room, right? So, so again, contradictions or apparent contradictions in Scripture can be explained if you just like did a careful anal, anal, uh, analyzing of the text. Let's get back. No contradictions can be found. Forty different authors over a span of 1,500 years on three different continents in three different languages, and not one contradiction can be found. Not only that, did you know that there's a great graphic out there? It looks like a big rainbow, but it's a chart that shows you all the verses that are connected to one another, and there are more or if not just as much connections. It looks, it looks like a human brain. All the connections in your brain, and we don't fully understand the brain because there are so many connections. That's what scripture looks like. When you plot it out verse by verse and connect all the verses that are referenced to one another, it looks like this interweb, like a brain. And there are no contradictions. The only logical explanation for this is what Vodi Bakum says, that these writers of scripture were divinely inspired by one author. Y'all know I'm a, I'm a nerd and I love Lord of the Rings. I, I encourage you all to read those books. But J.R.R. Tolkien, the, the creator of Lord of the Rings, he wrote the books. Before he even penned the first line, he developed the entire world, the history of this world, before he ever penned the first line of The Hobbit. Why is that important? Because if you just write a book and piece it together as you go, what, what happens? You run into contradictions, and then you got to change things, and you got to retcon things. And what happens to your story? It falls apart. The Bible doesn't do that. Why? Because God, being outside of the story of our world, created the whole world in which we live. Before the foundations of the earth were laid, planned our redemption in Christ, and then fulfilled it according to the scriptures. Look at 1 Corinthians verse 4, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Did you know that Jesus fulfilled himself, Jesus fulfilled hundreds of prophecies? And, and I'm not saying like this. Like, I could come in here and pretend to be a prophet and say, I perceive someone has a bad back this morning. Right? Like, that's pretty obvious. I've got a bad back this morning, right? Like, that's pretty obvious. I perceive that some of you are stressed. Right? That's not the kind of prophecy I'm talking about. In just a second... We're going to look at Psalm 22, and I hope that this drives it home. But Jesus fulfilled very specific prophecies. And we're going to see that in just a second. So, why can we choose to believe in the resurrection? Number one, 
It was, it, it's, a, the, it's in the Bible, and the Bible is this reliable collection of historical documents. It's reliable. It's historical. Did you know that 25,000 archaeological digs, over 25, that's not 2,500, 25,000 archaeological digs have been inspired by the Bible? Did you know that archaeologists will look at Old Testament writings when they want to go find something first? Why? Because it's reliably historical. The Bible's never gotten anything wrong in history. Why? Because eyewitnesses are writing down what they see. There, there have been numerous cities in Egypt that are, that are written about in the Bible. And archaeologists and, and historians would say, look, the Bible's not real because these cities don't exist. Guess what? We found them. They're there. Just like the Bible says. Exactly where the Bible says they would be. We have found different stellas and different writings. We found, we found a, a piece of, of door that says the house of David, being King David from Scripture. Again, it's a reliable collection of historical documents. Why can you believe the Bible? Do you believe your history books in school? Those weren't written by eyewitnesses. Did you know that? Your textbooks in school were not written. I promise you, the person that wrote the book on European history was not alive during the French and Indian War. Right? Like they, they, they had other first-hand accounts that they used, but what were those first-hand accounts? Eyewitnesses writing down what they saw. So again, we can believe the Bible because it's reliably historical written by eyewitnesses. We've already determined Paul's an eyewitness. Check out what he says. He says this, verse 6, Then he appeared, Jesus appeared, to more than 500 brothers, most of whom are still alive. Let me break, let me, let me break down a rebuttal to this. There's an argument out there that says that, they were, that this was just a hallucination. Can 500 people have the same hallucination? No. But not only that, he appeared to 500 people at one time, but he appeared to the disciples at another time. He appeared to the Marys at, a, at another time and at different times. Once in a room, once on a beach, once at the tomb. So can this be some mass hallucination that everybody in different times and in different places all saw the same thing? If it were just a hallucination. No. That, that doesn't make any sense. They're grasping for straws at this point. Again, if I slugged Micah across the face and, and all of you said, even if just ten of you said, I saw Easton do it, and not one person said, no, Easton didn't do it, what would happen to me? I'd be guilty. It was written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. This is supremely important. Why? Paul says, most of whom are still alive. He's saying, if you don't believe me, go ask them. And they'll tell you. Let me, let me contrast that just to kind of give you the importance of that statement. Let's say that I wake up one day and I claim to be illiterate, meaning I can't read and write, right? I wake up one day and, and for my whole life I haven't been able to read and write, and then I just disappear for a long time. And then I come back and I'm like, and I've got a book in my hand, and I say, hey guys, guys, I wrote this book in a cave even though I can't read and write because God told me how and told me what to write. What would your first question be? Was, any, was anybody else there? No, no, just trust me, right? Just believe me. You've got to take my word for it. Have this blind faith that God spoke to me and I wrote this book. Oh, can I see the book? Yeah, 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 yeah. 
man, there looks like there's a lot of contradictions in this book, a lot of violence in this book. I don't know. Are you sure nobody else was there? Nope, nope, just take my word for it. I, I just described to you Muhammad going into a cave and writing the Quran. You see the difference? The Bible is what we call falsifiable. That, that is a huge term when you're talking about evidence and legality and, and this and that. Why is falsifiable a big deal? It means you can prove it wrong. I, like, you don't have to take my word for it, is what Paul is saying. If you don't believe me, go ask someone else. They can prove me wrong. And if they can be proven wrong, what does it mean? You can be proven right. How are you proven right? If I went to these 500 people and I said, hey, did you see Christ alive? And they all say, yeah. No, I saw him. He was walking around. He talked to me. We shared a meal together. I put my hands in his side and my fingers in his hands. So the Bible can be proven wrong, but guess what? It never was. There is no evidence out there to suggest that anybody, any of these witnesses, came forward and said, no, Paul's crazy. Or any of these other 500 people are crazy. We were hallucinating. Nobody said that. The Bible has never been proven wrong by eyewitnesses. They try to prove it wrong. People today still try to prove it wrong by finding these contradictions contradictions and so on and so forth, but it's never been proven wrong. I'm going to say that again. The Bible has never been falsified. You do not have to take Paul's word for it. It was written by 40 different people over the span of 1,500 years, was falsifiable and never falsified. It's reliable. It's historical. It was written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events in fulfillment of specific, specific prophecies. Not general, fortune-telling, specific. Let's look at one of these specific prophecies. Turn with me to Psalm 22. Psalm chapter 22. When Christ was on the cross, does anybody remember what he, what he said? He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If I were, if I were to say, say, amazing grace, it calls that song to your memory, right? Psalm 22 is a song. Let's remember that. The Psalms are, are songs. It's the hymn book of the Bible, right? So Jesus on the cross starts Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What is he doing? He's calling the attention of everyone around the cross back to Psalm 22. Why? Why, why does he want the crowd to remember the song Psalm 22? Because it's about him. It's about him. David wrote this psalm. A thousand years, I'm going to say it again, one thousand years before Jesus was even born. Let's read it. Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning, oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. You are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In your fathers, in our, in you, our fathers trusted. They trusted and deli and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued, and you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man scorned by mankind and despised by my people, by the people. Again, Christ was scorned and despised for claiming to be who he was, God. 
Verse 7, all who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads at me. That, that term right there, they make mouths at me. This refers to, in that culture, and it's going to look silly, stick with me. In that culture, people would protrude their lower lip like this, and they would wag their head. And that was essentially the same thing as giving the middle finger to somebody. It was an insult. Christ said, all who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. Again, Christ's birth was completely ordinary. His conception was miraculous. But his birth was completely ordinary. He was born just like any of us were born. He was taken from his mother's womb. And the Lord God the Father caused him to trust in him from, a, from birth. Verse 10. On you as I cast from my birth and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Verse 11. But not, be not far from me for trouble is near and, let, and there is none to help. Now here's where it gets really interesting. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. What does this symbolize? Again, it's a song, so we're going to read it literally as a poem. So we're going to look at the poetic language, right? Still literal rendering of the text. I'm literally reading it in the genre in which it's written. The bulls of Bashan represent powerful people of different nations. So who is that? The Romans. The Romans surround me. They have their mouths. I'm sorry, the, the religious leaders. The religious leaders of Jerusalem surround him. They have, they have their mouths open, ready to devour. We see that, right? The Jewish people, the religious leaders of the time, held several illegitimate trials to persecute Christ to death. Verse 14, I am poured out like water. When Jesus and John, you can read about this in the Gospel of John. When Jesus was crucified, they pierced his side with a spear. And John records that blood and water poured out. Why? When, when people were crucified, their heart rate accelerated a great deal. And when their heart rate accelerates a great deal, you go into a, 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 a shock, a sense of sh shock. I can't remember all the exact medical terms, and I didn't write them down. But you go into a specific shock, and it's a, me it's a medical condition, and your lungs start to fill with water. This is very common of crucifixions their heart rate would start to beat very, very fast. Their lungs would fill with fluid. So when Jesus was pierced, blood and water poured out because they pierced his lung. Let's keep reading. Verse 14, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. Again, Psalm 22 the heart is like wax, that heart rate causing the lungs to fill with fluid. So he's poured out like water because his heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. What, again, when Jesus was on the cross, what did he say? That he thirsts? So they, they dipped a sponge in some sour wine mixed with water and they put it up to his mouth to drink. Why? To fulfill the scriptures. And my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. Alright, dogs were back then not cute fluffy little pets that we kept inside. They weren't family members. They were wild beasts that hung outside and honestly a burden. Like people didn't want them. This represents the Gentiles that surrounded Christ, the Romans. The Romans 
surrounded him. A company of e evildoers in encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. Read that again. Don't skip over it. This was written a thousand years before Jesus was born. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and they gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. For my clothing, they cast lots. For time's sake, we're going to stop there. You all. What did they do with Christ's garments? They cast lots, divided them. Jesus was beaten with a whip, exposing his bones. He could count all of his bones. This isn't just detailing a crucifixion. This is detailing Christ's crucifixion very specifically a thousand years before he was born. And this was written by a man who had never seen a crucifixion. How do I know that David had never seen a crucifixion? It hadn't been invented yet. The Romans invented crucifixion hundreds of years after this was written. Why can you know that Christ is alive? Because eyewitnesses reported that they saw him. And they said, don't take my word for it. Go ask them. They saw it. In accordance with the scriptures, it happened. It was prophesied. This has to be from God. Church, Jesus is alive. Jesus is not a concept. Jesus is not simply a faith figure. He's not a religious head. He is God. And he is king. And he is alive, even more so than you and I are alive. He died and rose again. We still have to do that. Amen? There has been no other resurrection in history than Christ's. Now you might say, what about Lazarus? Lazarus had to die again, and he's still waiting. Amen? Those who have fallen asleep in Christ are still waiting for when Jesus comes back and raises us from the dead. Amen? Church, Christ was our older brother, the first fruits of the resurrection. That means more to come. That means if you have faith in Christ, you are no longer in your sin. Jesus is alive. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you that you didn't give us blind faith, that you gave us facts of your resurrection. That we can stand assured knowing that you are alive, Jesus, and that you hear our prayers, and that you are reigning on your throne. And Lord, we look forward to the day that you're coming back to raise us from the dead. Thank you, Jesus, for taking our sin and making us holy and righteous, for saving us by the gospel. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.